Hello, God bless you. My name is Stephen. I'm pastor of Graffiti Fellowship Church. We're located in Brooklyn, New York. And it's time for today's daily devotion. This is where we take a chapter from the Bible and we read it together. Simple as that. We post these videos five days a week, but you can access them at any time. If you're finding us for the first time, go back and look through our playlists and the the books of the Bible that we've gone through together already are organized by playlist. And every video in a playlist is a chapter in a book. And every playlist is the entirety of a book. So Matthew, there's a playlist there with 28 videos because there's 28 chapters and so forth. Um, and this is just a tool designed to help us include uh, some time in God's Word in our daily routine. We think it's uh, for those of us who are disciples of Jesus, who want to learn from Him, follow Him, live our lives for Him, it's a necessary uh, part of our daily routine, and this is just a tool to help um, help accommodate that. We read from the New Living Translation. I mention that from time to time. I don't think I've mentioned that in a while. So I'll tell you that here. Uh, there are many different English translations of the Bible. We speak English in our church, so we use an English translation. But there are many different translations to choose from, and we have chosen what's called the NLT, or the New Living Translation, simply because it is the most accessible, arguably the easiest to understand reading level. Therefore, it makes the content of the Bible uh, accessible to the largest number of people. We've got some folks in our ministry, for example, who are not necessarily strong readers. Uh, we have a whole lot of people in our uh, fellowship who have never read the Bible, and so they're going through it for the first time. We have a lot of people who are um, very well educated in their country of origin, but they are English language learners for whom English is not their first or native language. And if you've ever studied another language, you know that even if you're conversant in that language, academic subjects um, just operate at a higher register. And therefore are more difficult to understand. And so for those reasons and more, we've chosen this translation. It's not the only one. We're not even saying it's the best translation. I don't think there is a best translation. That's like saying, which is the best uh, screwdriver, right? Well, the one that you need for the job that you're doing is the one that's appropriate. And we find that this uh, New Living Translation is the best tool for the job that we're doing here. So uh, enough about all of that, but I do like to mention those things from time to time, just um, so that if you're new here, you understand what we're doing and and why we're doing it. And uh, these videos are, are intended to be a tool for the people of our church to do exactly what we encourage them to do, and that is to include uh, some time in God's Word in their daily routine. But these videos are also being accessed by folks from all over the place, all over the globe in, in some respects, and we're thankful for that too. So welcome to you. We're reading the Gospel of Luke in this particular series of videos, and we are very close to the end. We're at the next to last chapter of Luke's Gospel. So today we're going to read Luke chapter 23, and uh, then the final chapter will be the subsequent chapter, Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 22, which we read last time, is uh, very long, over 70 verses. Luke chapter 23 is also long, but not nearly as long as Luke 22. This chapter has 56 verses. Uh, we saw in Luke chapter 2 Jesus' betrayal. We saw Judas Iscariot scheming under the uh, influence of Satan. The Bible's very clear about that. Uh, we see Jesus at the Last Supper, that Passover meal with his disciples. We see the uh, installation and the commemoration, not commemoration, but, but certainly the um, inauguration 
of the ordinance, the sacrament of the Holy Communion, as Jesus himself was the first one to take that bread and take the cup and say, these represent my body and blood, which are given as a sacrifice for you. So do this to remember me. Uh, We saw Jesus arrested. We saw him before the council, which is comprised of the Sadducees and the Pharisees. We saw this mock trial. They've arrived at a foregone conclusion. It's what we would call a kangaroo court. They've all, they know that their, their job is to find them guilty, so now they just need to figure out how to do that, and so they've done that. Uh, we also see in the midst of all that, Peter's denial of Jesus, which Jesus prophesied. And so now, in 23, our subsections are, looks like there's four of them. We see Jesus' trial before Pilate. Jesus had, a, had a, something of a trial in the academic sense at least, before the Jewish council, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But their pronouncement, their desire, is for an execution. And the Jews are under the rule of the Roman authorities at this time. And they are not permitted to carry out a capital punishment, a capital sentence, uh, without Roman approval. So Jesus has been found guilty by the Jewish leaders. Now he has to also go to the Roman leadership and for them to authorize or deny the sentence that the Jewish leadership have, um, have pronounced against Jesus. Okay, So the Jews were, to some degree, allowed to govern themselves. But at a certain level, at a certain severity, they had to get... Uh, things approved by the Roman authorities. So that's where we begin. Then we will see the crucifixion of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the burial of Jesus. And that will take us through Luke chapter 23. So let's read, beginning in verse 1. Again, this is Jesus' trial before Pilate. Pilate was the Roman uh, official, the Roman governor. It says, Then the entire council, those are those Jewish leaders, took Jesus to Pilate, the Roman governor. They began to state their case. This man has been leading our people astray by telling them not to pay their taxes to the Roman government by claiming he is the Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, You've said it. Pilate turned to the leading priest and to the crowd and said, I find nothing wrong with this man. And then they became insistent. But he's causing riots by teaching wherever he goes, all over Jerusalem, from, or all over uh, uh, Judea, from Galilee to Jerusalem. Oh, was he a Galilean? Pilate asked. When they said that he was, Pilate sent him to Herod and Tippus because Galilee was under Herod's jurisdiction, and Herod happened to be in Jerusalem at the time. So he's kind of passing the buck because this is a politically sensitive matter. Herod was delighted at the opportunity to see Jesus because he had heard about him and had been hoping for a long time to see him perform a miracle. He asked Jesus question after question, but Jesus refused to answer. And meanwhile, the leading priests and teachers of religious law stood there shouting their accusations. Then Herod and his soldiers began mocking and ridiculing Jesus, and finally they put a royal robe on him and sent him back to Pilate. Herod and Pilate, who had been enemies before, became friends that day. Then Pilate called together the leading priests and the other religious leaders, along with the people, and he announced his verdict. You brought this man to me, accusing him of leading a revolt. I've examined him thoroughly on this point in your presence, and I find him innocent. Herod came to the same conclusion and sent him back to us. Nothing this man has done calls for the death penalty, so I'll have him flogged, and then I will release him. Then a mighty roar rose from the crowd, and with one voice they shouted, Kill him and release Barabbas to us. Barabbas was in prison for taking part in an insurrection in Jerusalem against the government and for murder. Pilate argued with them because he wanted to release Jesus, but they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! For the third time he demanded, Why? What crime has he committed? I've found no reason to sentence him to death. I'll have him flogged, but then I'll release him. But the mob shouted louder and louder, demanding that Jesus be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate sentenced Jesus to die as they demanded. Other translations in this exchange say that the crowd shouted, 
that if you don't crucify this man, you're no friend of Caesar's. They're playing politics. So Pilate sent to Jesus to die, as they demanded. As they had requested, he released Barabbas to him, to them, the man in prison for insurrection and murder, but he turned Jesus over to them to do as they wished. Verse 26. As they led Jesus away, a man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, happened to be coming in from the countryside, and the soldier seized him and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd trailed behind, including many grief-stricken women. But Jesus turned to say to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For the days are coming when they will say, Fortunate indeed are the women who are childless, the wombs that have not borne a child, and the breasts that have never nursed. People will beg the mountains, fall on us, and plead with the hills, bury us. If these things were done when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him, and when they came to a place called the Skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, and the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched, and the leader scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the Chosen One. The soldiers mocked him, too, by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. A sign was fastened above him with these words, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed, So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us, too, while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, I assure you, today you'll be with me in paradise. By this time it was about noon and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone. And suddenly the curtain of the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Uh, I like what the King James says here. It says, it was rent in twain. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what happened, he worshipped God and said, surely this man was innocent. And when all the crowd came to see the crucifixion, when the crowd who had come to see the crucifixion saw what happened, they went home in deep sorrow. But Jesus' friends, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, and he was a member of the Jewish high council, but he had not agreed with the decision and actions of the other religious leaders. He was from the town of Arimathea in Judea, and he was waiting for the kingdom of God to come. He went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body, and then he took the body down from the cross, wrapped it in a long sheet of linen cloth, and laid it in a new tomb that had been carved out of rock. This was done late on Friday afternoon, the day of preparation, as the Sabbath was about to begin. As his body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb where his body was placed. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body, but by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun, so they rested as required by the law. That concludes... Luke chapter 23, and there's a, I I say this at the end of every chapter, but there's a lot uh, of great, really significant, really important content here. And we could probably spend several videos um, drawing some distinctions and just pointing out some some things that uh, have great importance. Um... uh, Perhaps I'll just uh, offer this. Um, Most of our videos on this channel point to Jesus' sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection, uh, which means most of our videos on this channel point to the cross. And that's appropriate because as a church, everything we do 
points to the cross. And uh, it has happened in the past, in the recent past, that some people have shared in the comments that um, uh, criticisms... For example, one person offered recently something to the effect of, well, Jesus was crucified on a wooden pole, not shaped like a cross. And if you would just do some historical research, you would know that. And that is a theory that I'm quite familiar with. And it is a theory that a minority of scholars do adhere to. Um, meaning, most scholars don't think that that's true, but some do, and some scholars of good reputation. And so, tradition teaches us that Jesus was crucified on that T-shaped cross. Um, but it is 100% true that the Romans, who for whom crucifixion was a method of execution. They crucified people often on T-shaped crosses, and they also crucified people often on just uh, vertical stakes, a pole, if you like. They did both. And historically, we don't have, it's my conviction that we really don't have any way of knowing for sure if Jesus' cross was indeed a cross or if it was just a stake. There's some language there being translated out of Latin. Latin wasn't the language of the day. There's, some, there's a lot of translation and, and a lot that's just been lost to the history and while it's my belief that Jesus was crucified on a T-shaped cross because of what we read here, uh, where it talks about um, Simon from Cyrene coming and um, carrying the, the, the cross, other historical accounts point to the portion of the cross that he carried being that crossbar, that horizontal piece. We can't say that for sure. And there is a, in one group in particular, one denomination of uh, people, one group with whom we disagree on a lot of theology, uh, but who really think that it's their opinion, and they get to have this opinion. I say this with all due respect, but it's their opinion that this cross, it was a stake, not a T-shaped cross. To them, that's really an important issue. And um, for me, it's just not that an important an issue. Does it matter if Jesus was crucified on a T-shaped cross or on a wooden stake? No. I don't think it does at all. What matters is why Jesus was crucified. Because He was undeniably crucified. Why He was crucified was so that you and I by making Him king of our life, by trusting Him, surrendering our life to Him, the same way He surrendered His life for us, we can be re restored, reunited with God. He did that for us. And to accomplish that, He was crucified. The shape of the wood doesn't matter at all. The undeniable truth, even atheist scholars cannot deny that the man, Jesus, was put to death by crucifixion. And it is a horrible, horrific way to die. Crucifix, the word excruciating, it just it means like it's so painful we don't have words for it. That word means out of the cross. Excruciating means out of the cross. So Jesus' death, His sacrificial death for us, was so painful, they had to invent a new word to describe it. That's what matters. That He did it willingly. He laid down His life. It wasn't taken from Him. 
He did it sacrificially in my place and in your place. That matters. The shape of the wood doesn't matter at all. It's understanding why he did it. It's, it's believing, knowing the truth that he did. Understanding why and allowing that to change the way we live our lives. That's what matters. And so if you're wondering about the shape of the cross, I believe it was a T-shaped cross. I can't say that. For, with certainty. Um, that T-shape is certainly more recognizable in the symbolism that we use to honor Jesus' sacrifice. But if it was a wooden stake, it matters not in the least. The fact that God sent His Son to earth to live a sinless life, to die a death He didn't deserve, to redeem sinners like me and like you, that's what matters. That's what we've just read about in Luke chapter 23. And thanks be to God, when we read Luke chapter 24, the conclusion of Luke's gospel, we're going to see that that horrific, excruciating death wasn't the end. It was just the beginning, because we're going to see Jesus raised again to life in victory over sin and death and darkness. And He's going to establish His church so that His people can once again live a life close to God and under His protection. That's what matters. And I hope you have that kind of relationship with Jesus. Uh, if not, stick with us. We're going to keep reading His Word. And uh, I, just, I believe you're going to get to a point where you fall in love with Him like, like we have. Thanks for being here. Thanks for participating in this video. God bless you.